A colleague of mine recently asked me if I could visualize images in my mind. I responded, Of course everyone can. I can't, she replied. Surprised, I said, Don't be silly. You wouldn't be able to function otherwise. However, the reality is that someone with aphantasia cannot comprehend the experience of mental imagery, just as I cannot truly understand how her brain functions. I would probably describe myself as having hyperphantasia, characterized by a highly vivid imagination. For example, when asked for directions, I can vividly visualize the route in my mind's eye. In contrast, my colleague knows the same directions but processes the information as mere facts. She sees no images in her mind, only darkness. It's akin to encountering someone with the ability of echolocation. Without that ability myself, I can't fathom what it's like to have it. She was quite upset upon realizing her brain's uniqueness, feeling as though everyone else possessed superpowers while she did not. Here's some information about aphantasia. Aphantasia is a condition where a person is unable to voluntarily conjure up mental imagery. This means that individuals with aphantasia are incapable of visualizing pictures in their mind's eye. The severity varies. Some may have faint mental imagery, while others experience none at all. It's crucial to understand that aphantasia is not a disease or disorder, but rather a variation in human experience. People with aphantasia typically think about objects and concepts without relying on visual imagery. For example, they might comprehend the concept of a red apple, but are unable to visualize it. They might use other senses or descriptive methods to recognize and think about objects. Instead of picturing a beach, they might conceptualize it by recalling the sound of waves, the scent of the sea, or a description of its layout. Aphantasia does not generally impact daily functioning. People with this condition can be as successful and creative as those with the ability to visualize imagery. Some individuals may not even realize they have a fantasia until they discover that others can visualize mental images. Conversely, the opposite of aphantasia is hyperphantasia, where individuals possess extremely vivid mental imagery. The precise cause of aphantasia remains unclear and is the subject of ongoing research. It is believed to be related to variations in brain function or structure but more exploration is required to fully comprehend these connections. The journey into understanding aphantasia begins centuries ago. Long before the term was coined, there were inklings in psychological and philosophical texts that not all individuals experienced mental imagery in the same way. Aristotle's early insights. Aristotle, in his work De Anima, On the Soul, hinted at variations in mental imagery among individuals, though his observations were more philosophical than scientific. Sir Francis Galton's pioneering study, the first empirical approach to studying mental imagery differences, was undertaken by Sir Francis Galton in the late 19th century. In his groundbreaking research, he discovered that not all individuals could form mental images, a revelation that was surprising at the time. Fast forward to the 21st century, the concept of aphantasia emerged from obscurity into the scientific spotlight, the Zeeman study. In 2005, a case study by Professor Adam Zeeman at the University of Exeter marked a significant turning point. Zeeman's study involved a patient, MX, who lost the ability to visualize after surgery. This case laid the groundwork for a deeper investigation into the phenomenon. A decade later, in 2015, Zeeman and his team published a more comprehensive study. It was here that the term aphantasia, meaning the absence of fantasy, was officially introduced. This study brought the condition to the attention of the scientific community and the public. The introduction of the term aphantasia and the preliminary findings of Zeeman's study were initially met with skepticism. The scientific community was cautious in acknowledging aphantasia as a distinct neurological condition. Early skepticism was rooted in the difficulty of objectively measuring an individual's subjective experience of mental imagery. Growing Recognition Gradually, as more people came forward with similar experiences and subsequent studies supported Zeeman's findings, the skepticism began to wane. The existence of aphantasia started to gain acceptance as a legitimate variation in human experience. The recognition of aphantasia opened new doors in the understanding of human cognition and perception. At its heart, aphantasia is characterized by the inability or significant difficulty in conjuring up mental images. This doesn't mean a lack of imagination, but rather a different way of experiencing thoughts and memories. Aphantasia is not a one-size-fits-all condition. 
There is a spectrum, ranging from those who have no mental imagery at all, to those who have limited or vague imagery. Understanding the symptoms of aphantasia helps in its identification and differentiation from other cognitive conditions. Most individuals discover they have aphantasia not through clinical diagnosis but through self-realization, often after a revelatory conversation or reading about the condition. Key features include the inability to voluntarily visualize loved ones' faces, familiar locations, or past events. However, involuntary imagery like dreams may still be present for some. Aphantasia can be present from birth, congenital, or acquired due to injury, surgery, or trauma. This distinction is crucial for understanding its etiology and manifestation. Congenital aphantasia. Individuals with congenital aphantasia have never experienced visual imagery. This form is often discovered in childhood or early adulthood. Acquired aphantasia. This can occur after brain injury, psychological trauma, or certain neurological conditions. The contrast between previous visual experiences and the new state of aphantasia can be particularly striking. Prevalence and awareness. How common is aphantasia? Understanding the prevalence of aphantasia helps in recognizing it as a significant variation in human experience. Estimating prevalence. Current estimates suggest that around 1 to 3% of the population might have aphantasia, but these numbers are tentative due to the subjective nature of the condition and lack of widespread awareness. Aphantasia often goes unrecognized because those who have it may not realize their experience of visualization is different from others. Daily life adaptations. Individuals with aphantasia often develop unique coping mechanisms and alternative strategies for tasks that typically rely on visual imagery, such as remembering faces or navigating spaces. Educational and professional adaptations. In academic and professional settings, people with aphantasia might lean more towards verbal, logical or kinesthetic learning and working styles, often excelling in areas that don't rely heavily on visual imagery. The emotional implications of aphantasia are as varied as the condition itself, impacting personal relationships, creativity and self-perception. Creativity and imagination in aphantasia. Contrary to common misconceptions, aphantasia does not equate to a lack of creativity or imagination. Please like and subscribe. If you found this video informative and helps spread information about various sleep disorders, please comment and let me know your experiences. Thank you for watching.